Today, we're testing eight different methods for clearing wine, mead, cider, and beer. So let's get started. The eight different methods that we're testing today are all available in your local brew shop or anywhere else. They are time itself, cold crashing, bentonite, gelatin, sparkloid, isinglass, polyclair tin, and Kisasaw and Chittosan. The first two are based around just letting your mead, wine, beer set for a long time. The last six are products you can buy that come in various sizes and forms and fashions that are used in clearing your mead, wine, cider. You might find them in your local brew shop or you might have to get them online, but they are made available to you. To start this test, I took four gallons of apple mead or sizer and split it into eight one and a half gallon containers. This is not clear because of the back sweetening agent I used. I used honey to back sweeten, so that's what's causing the haze that you see in each container. It is worth noting that often pectic haze comes from apples or fruits that are high in pectin, but this is not the cause of this lack of clarity. I'd like to walk you through what each one is and how you use it. So let's go ahead and talk about that. And then I will show you exactly how I ran this test. All right, here we are to talk about each element and how it works and why it might work. Let's go ahead and start with the two simplest ones that required no effort. Time, number one. Time works with clearing a brew because over time, the particles, the sediment, the things that are flowing in suspension or stuck in suspension will just fall to the ground. You know, ground being bottom of the container because of gravity and just how that works. Now this itself does work. Time works to clear a lot of brews and I've had it work really well actually. It just takes a lot of time and sometimes, I keep saying that word, it is um, months, weeks, years, depending on how crazy the, the situation is. One note here is that if your brew is high in pectin, that pectic haze can often lead to a longer time <laughs> for it to actually clear up. So time works. I don't want to discount this one. Did it work in this circumstance? Um, I guess you're going to find out. However, don't be afraid to let your stuff age if you want to clear it that way. Next one is cold crashing. Cold crashing is the same idea as time, but you are putting that vessel into the cold chamber normally like a fridge temp, somewhere between not freezing and um, you know, let's say 40, 42, 43, whatever the temp you wanna do. That colder temp theoretically takes all of the particles and all the things that we talked about with the regular time and helps to make them fall out of suspension faster. And this also does work in cer certain circumstances. So you can definitely use this it's just a quick inversion of the time aspect. This often works best when you're trying to literally pull big things out of suspension, like yeast. If you're trying to get all your yeast to drop to the bottom quick, throw it in your fridge and then boom, give it a couple days, week, and that stuff will all be at the bottom and then you can rack off of lots of those things. So time, cold crashing are kind of in the same vein. Cold crashing is just a, uh, colder version of that. Number three is Isinglass. Now, I'm gonna read some notes because I wanna get this totally right and make sure that I explain things well. And I have taken notes to help you out. So Isinglass uh, findings clarify beer or wine or mead by combining with yeast net negative charge and protein by electrostatic interaction and by physical enmeshment to form large aggregates which settle rapidly. So essentially, they're binding to the negative charge yeast and also the proteins that are there with this electrostatic interaction, essentially just doing this together. They then form a heavier particulate that falls to the bottom. That's what's happening. So they bind and then they go to the bottom. Some of my research found that the Isinglass findings are available in solutions, paste, flock, shredded leaf, ribbon, and whole leaf. Well, what I mostly found for us in brewing world in the brewing world, I should say, is that we can get them in um, liquid isinglass and powder isinglass. And the way it's used, here's how you use isinglass. 
you have to turn them into a liquid beforehand. So liquid Isinglass is easy because it's already there. Essentially you, for liquid Isinglass, just take one, this is one ounce per six gallons. So 0.166 ounces for one gallon. You kind of syringe it out and then you add it into the vessel for the liquid Isinglass. For the powdered Isinglass, you have to take and make it a liquid. So you take, this has a range of 0.01 to 0.1 grams per gallon of powdered Isinglass. And it's obviously based, I guess, on how much, uh, how crazy your uh, clarifying needs are. You take your amount of powdered Isinglass, you put it in a little bit of water, you make sure it's mixed up, and then you add that into the brew. So here are those ratios again for how much Isinglass to add per gallon. It's also important to note that like Isinglass and a lot of these do come from fish, um, the byproduct of fish or things like that. Stuff like gelatin comes from pigs. So if you are trying to avoid those aspects of brewing, then you wanna avoid Isinglass because it is a uh, fish-based finding or fish-based product. Number four, Sparkaloid. Sparkaloid is one of my favorites. It's right here. Here's that liquid Isinglass, by the way. Sparkaloid is a powder. You can buy it in bulk. I bought this whole bulk Sparkaloid for not too much money, it's a pound. This will last me an, an eternity. Because what it does is it is a, another finding agent which is effective against a wide range of hazes. Sparkaloid carries a positive charge and thus combines with the negative charged particles, removing them from the wine, pulling them down out of suspension. It should only be used on wine that's been racked at least once. So that's, I think, to help the process go along when it comes to like yeast and those things. I don't know that Sparkaloid's that effective, but when you've racked your brew and it's trying to get the little tiny particulates, the um, positive charged, sorry, the negative charged particles that are in there, then it helps that there's less things going on. So how much Sparkaloid do we use? We use one half teaspoon per gallon of brew. You're going to take one half teaspoon, put it into a cup of water, of boiling water, I should say, make sure it gets all mixed in and then you pour it right in. You saw me do that, or I did that for these brews um, just a little bit ago. Sparkaloid generally takes between five to eight days. So like on the pack, it says seven days for it to clear up. I've used Sparkaloid a lot. I like that you can buy it in bulk. And again, one half teaspoon per gallon. This is a pound. I don't know how many teaspoons are in a pound or however much this is, but that's a lot of fining Next up, we have Polyclair 10. Now this guy is a little bit contentious and I'm sure the people in the comments will have, have already roasted me. I bought this, this is from Crosby and Baker. It says Polyclair 10 Clarifier. I personally, after my research, am finding that I don't know that this is necessarily a clarifier because all my research points out that Polyclair 10 is a beer stabilizer that draws to the polyphenols via hydrogen bonding and then removes, and then is removed during filtration. So essentially it binds to a lot of these things and stabilizes the beer in a way. And then you you filter the brew. So there's an element here where I go, you're, you're filtering the brew. So are you really clarifying via this thing? I don't know, here's more information about it. Polyclair 10, the bonding occurs between the carbonyl groups of polyclair 10 ba uh, beer stabilizer and the hydroxyl groups of polyphenols. In short, this is more of a beer stabilizer. Is there some clearing that can occur because of it? Yes, I think so, but is its innate reasoning to be used to clear your beer, wine, mead, cider? Probably not. So, I'm gonna say that this one's not super effective and you'll see why here in a second, but someone can correct me in the comments if you have better experience with polyclaritin. Next up, we have gelatin. These are gelatin finings. So when you mix gelatin into wine or beer, it uses an electrostatic strategy to bind with proteins, tannins, and remaining yeast. The gelatin uses electrically attractive opposite charges that result in a stable particulate particle excuse me, with a neutral charge. This reaction causes the proteins, tannins, and yeast to rapidly fall to the bottom of the bottles or vessel, creating a very clear wine, beer, mead, cider. 
This also says gelatins can be used to take out the fennels and tannins in red wine, which we like red wine tannins, generally speaking. First of all, I bought it in a one ounce pack. I used about a, a eighth of a teaspoon for my half gallons, which means that we need a quarter teaspoon of this gelatin per gallon. And the way you do this is you get your gelatin findings, you put it into just a little bit of cold water. You let that set for, uh, I think it's an hour. After that hour, you boil that water so it becomes, everything's mixed up super, super well. And then at that point, you add your gelatin to the actual vessel. When you add it to the vessel, it should do what we just talked about, which everything we've talked about today thus far has been some sort of positive charge attracting to negative charges and then dropping those things out of suspension. So these are really just a, I mean, it's, it's science, but it's really just um, a magnet. Essentially, you're magneting to the particulates that you don't want to keep, and then they fall to the bottom. So here's how much gelatin to add per gallon of brew. So two little fun facts here. One, this comes from pig, pigs generally. Um, this is a pig-based thing. So if you are you know, trying not to do that, try not to use um, animal-based things. This is not the way to go. And according to Wikipedia, this is where I don't think it's true. One ounce of gelatin clears 1,000 gallons of wine. I'm a little bit sketched out by that. I don't think that's true. We got two more. We got bentonite coming in. This is a fun one. Bentonite is a gray clay granule that is used in wine as a clarifier. It's unique that it possesses a negative electrostatic charge, which again is like that magnet side we're talking about. This attracting charge along with hydrogen bonding causes suspended particles in the wine to cling to it as it settles to the bottom of the container. Again, positive. This is a negative charge. Positive charges, boom things go to the bottom. Here's how you use it. Most people say to use one to three grams per gallon in your wine or mead. You add your bentonite into a uh, small amount of water. You stir it really well for 10 minutes. Generally, I use warmer water in this circumstance. As you're stirring, you just wanna make sure it's not clumping up because it is a clay. It literally tries to go together. At that point, once it's stirred up well, you add it into the brew. You can add bentonite pre-fermentation. And a lot of people do this. I think there's an um, issue that I ran into by not adding the bentonite for me in this circumstance at the beginning of fermentation. Most people do it at the beginning. You can also do it later on, but I think it's more successful if you add it at the beginning of fermentation. Last but not least, we have these two things. We have Kisasol and Chitosan. You might find them in like its own little packet where it's a Kisasol Chitosan. They have a bunch of different names. Um, Dual clear, stuff like that. I think there's some names. I'll put some lists up here. I bought these in a bigger bulk because I use a lot of them. So this one has a little more information. So here's what Kisasol and Chitosan are. Kisasol, also known as silica oil. Kisasol is a fining agent made with colloidal silica. It primarily works on negatively charged particles in wine or beer. Chitosan is a polysaccharide admitted in winemaking as clarifying antimicrobacterial microbial and chelating agent, big words. So how do these work? Generally, they recommend post-fermentation, you degas your brew so that all the CO2 is out of suspension, which is helpful. You then add part A, which is the Kisasol, and you're going to add it at 2.5 milliliters per gallon. You add this first, you wait an hour, and you make sure it's mixed in. And then you add your Chitosan, which is at 8.3 milliliters per gallon. The Chitosan is a fish-based thing. It's derived from the exoskeleton of crustaceans and is positively charged. So we have a negative charge coming from the, the uh, Kisasol, and we have a positive charge coming from the Chitosan. So essentially, it hits all different aspects of whatever haze you have. This comes in and clears out a lot of your uh, negative charges or things, bonds to those. The Chitosan clears through and gets a lot of the positive charged ones that bonds to those. So again, conjunction works well. It is fish-based though, so just keep that in mind. I'm trying to give you all the warnings that I can. All right, we've heard about all of these things. If you'd like to give your experience and how you've used them, let me know below, especially on Polyclair. Let's go see how they worked for this brew. All 
All right, here we are for the finale. You have seen an explanation of what each one is, which clearing method, how it works. You've seen a time lapse that took me a month to complete. During that time lapse of the 30 days, uh, about a week and a half in, I realized I had made a kind of a critical mistake and I tried to rectify it the best of my ability. The gelatin, as I talked to my local brew shop friend, Liberty, uh, I talked to him about gelatin. I said, it's not really doing much. And he said, well, everything I've heard about gelatin is you have to put it into the like fridge. Okay, well, I hadn't done that. So I went ahead and I moved. That's why you see it disappear. That's why you also see the Isinglass disappear because I put both of those into the fridge. So there were three things in the fridge, cold crashing and I guess using their stuff. There was the Isinglass, there was the, um, the gelatin and the cold crashing method. So the other five obviously were still out there. You can see them here and I'll get a close up of each one so that you're aware of what's going on, but some of them worked, some of them did not. This has been a month. Could I have waited two, three, four, five months? I'm sure I could have. However, the truth is, um, that's at that point you're just letting time do its thing. And part of this test was to see if these clearing methods would work in a shorter amount of time. So let's go, this is the same order they were in. We've got time right here. You can see it's not, really different. I mean, it's pretty much the same as it was. And that's not really super surprising. This thing might clear in the next month, two, three, four, five months, who knows? Time is kind of fickle to figure out. So that obviously didn't work very well. Cold crashing, nothing put into it. We just put it in the cold chamber. I feel like, you know, I'd love to sit here and say that it made a difference, but I don't think it made a difference in this circumstance. Cold crashing does work in other circumstances, especially when it comes to yeast and that kind of solid. The sort of haze that we have here was obviously not cleared by cold crashing or time. Next up, we have the bentonite version. Uh, there is definitely a little bit of sediment at the bottom. So some stuff was pulled out, but that's also probably part of the bentonite that's at the bottom there. One thing I also did, you know, in my research, just making sure I did this right, um, a lot of people talk about putting bentonite in primary and how that is more effective. Well, I didn't put it in primary fermentation. So could that have been more effective? I think so. Was it effective as a clearing agent later on? Obviously not. Next up, we have our first one that's actually done something, and that's the gelatin. That's after my uh, week of not seeing anything. I took and I put it into the fridge and you see here that it is somewhat cleared up. I mean, it's still got a little bit of fuzziness to it, but there's a fair amount of stuff here at the bottom and uh, it's somewhat clear, decently effective. Sparkaloid is this next one. Sparkaloid was super effective. If you watch it on the time lapse, it within I think a week had pulled down all of those things, particles. And this thing is pretty dang clear. I did accidentally mix some stuff up in the moving process, trying to get it to this table. So that does have a little bit of fluffy friends in there, but Sparkaloid, very effective. Next up was Isinglass. I've never really used liquid Isinglass. And this is cold. Obviously I talked about it being the fridge. Didn't really work. I would love someone to, uh, or to have someone walk me through why the Isinglass wasn't necessarily as effective. I don't know much about it. So maybe I'm just unaware. I don't know, but Isinglass did not work very well in this circumstance. The Polyclare 10 or poly Polyclar 10, whatever it is, uh, did not also work. Still hazy. I'd love another uh, explanation. If anyone can continue to talk to me about what I might've done wrong or why it would not have worked. And the last one that is arguably the most clear of all of them is Kieselsol and Chitosan, which is a duo combo. Um, some people talk about the Kieselsol side. If you just use it, it can sometimes clear a brew. I did both, obviously, because they often run in tandem. So if we're going from most clear to least clear, I mean, we only have three that really did anything right now. We have most clear being the Kieselsol and Chitosan. Next up, it's a little bit of a tie or close, but the Sparkaloid was the next one here. And in third place, we have the Gelatin. The rest of them, I would argue, are the same level of clarity. So, 
Those are my top three that I'm choosing for this test. That's my end result in resolve. However, this is not conclusive to say never use the ones that did not do well in this circumstance. Like I said, bentonite often does well in primary. Time can be effective way to clear a brew. It just takes a while. Cold crashing can also be an effective way to clear a brew. Um, I don't really know about these other two right here, honestly. I'm not familiar with Isinglass or Polyclar. And maybe you are. Now you might be asking, is there a taste difference? I don't think many people care about this, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quickly run through and taste a small sample of each one and come back and tell you if I taste any difference. I don't think I'm gonna taste a difference. We'll see. Okay, so granted that was a lot of tasting in a short amount of time, but I'm very familiar with this mead and what it tastes like. I taste no difference. I don't think there's any taste change that comes with the addition of these ingredients. Now you can still choose to use them as you want. That's totally fine. I have no problem with you doing what you want in that regard. I just wanted to put these to the test. If you have experience with any of these things, I'd love to hear your experience and what maybe you think went wrong with certain ones. Again, I'm not, I'm not gonna sit here and say that I've done this test in the thousand different ways you can do it, but I have done it in this regard. And I find these results to be kind of conclusive for me. I personally will be continuing to use bentonite. I like that. Sparkaloid's also great. I'm actually getting to know gelatin a little bit. This could be a new one for me. And I use plenty of Kisasol and Chitosan on a, uh, you know, I'll say weekly, on an often basis. So anyways, I hope you've enjoyed. I do lots of tests like this and I've done lots of tests regarding uh, wine and mead and various things. Feel free to subscribe if you'd like to do that. Leave a comment down below. And if you wanna find all the information about each one of these things, that's chaptered in this YouTube video if you want more info about each one of these clarifiers. So thanks for watching. I don't have anything to cheers with, but cheers.